Hi, everyone, and welcome to Spotlight with Scientists in School. Today, I'm joined by Ahmed El Ghanzuri, who is the recipient of the Clean 50 Emerging Leader Award, and he is currently the Sustainability Strategy Manager at GM Canada. I'm so excited. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Betty. Great to be here. Yeah, you have a pretty amazing career already, but I want to start right at the beginning. Like, were you sure. a curious child? What kind of kid were you? Uh, I think, yeah, I was definitely a very curious kid. Um, you know, to give you a little bit about Lil Ahmed, you know, I started collecting stamps when I was 10 years old. Um, I thought my town's librarian was the coolest coolest person ever. So I just get to set the stage. Right, um, right. But yeah, no, I really enjoyed exploring new things, learning about things. Um, I loved experiments. Um, so just doing things and seeing what would happen. I would take, um, I'd fill the tub up with water and see what would sink and what would float. Uh, my parents really kind of encouraged this, like, go out and test things out. I'm sure one time I took their brand new cordless phone and I tried the sink or float test. So maybe that got them rethinking how much they want to encourage me. Um, it sank, if you're curious. Um, but yeah, no, I... I was always loving to try things. Um, my love for, you know, I'm an engineer and I think that all started, I love Lego. Um, right. and just like building little things and seeing, you know, how much it would take to topple over. I still love Lego. I actually got a little Lego here at my desk. So whenever I'm like brainstorming, I'll take pieces out and just like to clear my head. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that yeah. was kind of me as a kid. And you mentioned engineering, so you're, you're a curious mm. kid, and then, you know, you want to continue, and you went to engineering, and we chatted a little bit before I pressed record about how you and yeah. I both went to the most amazing university, McMaster yes. University <laughs> in Hamilton. I loved it. Uh, engineering was always one of those programs, like, it seemed so intense. All you engineers also had mm -hmm. to take, like, an extra load, right? Extra courses more than yeah. everybody else, so very intense mm -hmm. program. Uh, but what drew you to engineering? So yeah, building on that curiosity, um, I also grew up in a small town called Tecumseh, just outside of Windsor, Ontario, but my background is Egyptian. So every summer we'd go back to Cairo um, and there I was fascinated by the tall buildings and, and the towers and then obviously the pyramids. And that is what made me want to go into structural engineering. I really want to build bridges and skyscrapers. Um, and I loved Lego, like I said. So to me, it was just like adult Lego in high school, I was like, oh, I can play with Lego and still get paid. Cool. And then when I went to engineering, engineering, I discovered environmental engineering. Um, and that, you know, seeing that I could combine my passion for being outside and nature with a job was really neat. Um, I liked I got my hands dirty. You know, I had classes where we're literally in soil and then in a lab making drinking water. So that was really cool. So I kind of loved combining all these different aspects of my life that I really enjoyed. Okay, so now this kind of makes sense. My next question yeah. is that when you were done engineering, you mm -hmm. completed internships in Switzerland and you went to Egypt as well um, yeah. and Sudan looking at water as a as a human right. That's um, right, yeah. Right? So that's, that's pretty interesting. And I read that the United Nations has that as one of its sustainable development goals um, yeah. by 2030. Tell me a little bit about your research and why it's important to you. Yeah, so I did do a double master's at McMaster, so I went back and uh, at the United Nations University. Uh, a lot of my research focused here in Indigenous Canadian communities and then in Uganda and Kenya. Um, and really what I loved about this is it let me take that technical knowledge I got from engineering and pursue it in a master's, get more detailed with the numbers and equations, kind of like nerd out on it. But then the United Nations piece was like, okay, so what? Now what? You've got this. How can you make it, you know, solve a problem, a real life problem? And that's exactly what I wanted to do. In, you know, I saw the similarities in lack of access to drinking water in Canadian indigenous communities and then in rural uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and, you know, so actually just recently um, in February-ish, the Canadian government released a big report. We've made big strides, but still, you know, very dishearteningly, 29 communities in, in Canada all indigenous communities still don't have access to clean water. And a lot of these communities are not too far from most, uh, where most of us live and they still cannot drink their, um, their, their water. And it's something that we all take for granted. If you think of how many faucets and shower heads we all have at home and we just turn it on and it can be cold or hot. And yet some of us, our neighbors don't have that. And I think 
access to water should really not be something that we have to fight for and right. should be really seen as a human right. Um, that's, a, that's amazing, Ahmed. Um, uh, really interesting work that you've done there and it continues. Um, you are mm -hmm. really focused on sustainability and right now you work for General Motors and you are focusing on air emissions and carbon. So yeah. what is a carbon footprint exactly? Sure, so carbon footprint is the amount of carbon uh, that we make from doing things. So for example, take electricity. Uh, if it's not from a renewable source like wind and solar or hydro, which is water, then that energy produces carbon. You know, another source of carbon is the tailpipe emissions from driving a gas powered vehicle. So if you ever use gasoline or natural gas or anything, that burning it releases carbon into the atmosphere. Carbon footprint is adding up all of these little things that we're doing in our day-to-day -day lives and seeing how much ca carbon is emitted from that. And you add all that up and that's your carbon footprint. Okay, and so what can we do? Because we've all heard we need to reduce our carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. What can you and I do every day, day-to-day uh, -day, that we can reduce our carbon footprint? So carbon itself is naturally occurring. So it's already in the atmosphere. Um, but what we don't want to do is add too much to it. And that's what you and I kind of do. So um, one thing we can do is drive less. Um, so bike and walk and things like that, or use an electric car. Um, we can also look at how much meat we eat, uh, looking at the things that we buy and where are they coming from? Where are they being shipped from? Uh, another example is also electricity. Um, so even in Ontario, where I live, a lot of our electricity coming, it comes from pretty green sources, but still using it releases a little bit of carbon. So if you think about, you know, if you're not using, not in a room, turning off the lights, turning off the TV when you're not using it, things like that. You know, I use this all the time, even in big projects at work. Um, so we have a factory called Kami in Ingersoll, Ontario, just outside of London, Ontario. And we did a big project there where we tried to reduce our energy. And that meant looking at small things like the TVs and water coolers, but also the giant um, manufacturing equipment and how can we turn those off. So all those little things, you do it little by little um, and you can reduce your electricity and reduce your carbon emissions. Yeah, so all the little things do add up, right? They, they all, really do. They yep. really do, they all add up. So you're continuing the whole theme of sustainability and now, uh, like I said in the intro, you are the sustainability strategy manager mm -hmm. at General Motors Canada. What kind of exciting projects are you working on at GM that um, can get us on the road to uh, sustainability? <laughs> Yeah, so what's really exciting is just last year, uh, GM, we uh, announced our plan to be carbon neutral by 2040 in all of our global products and operations. So what that means is all the things that we sell and how we make them will not release carbon um, or will be offset. And what we really wanna do is try to put everyone in an electric vehicle. So in the future, we want to see a world with zero crashes, zero emissions and zero congestion. That's our vision. Uh, and to do that, we believe the way future into the future is electric cars and autonomous cars, so self-driving cars that can really help navigate this whole system. Um, we made, you know, this aspiration to be carbon neutral last year, and we've just been like going at it and working really hard um, to make that happen. Um, one of our biggest emissions for us, for our carbon footprint of the company, is the cars that we make. So we're looking at how do we switch them um, from a gas-powered vehicle into an electric car. And what's really exciting now is that, you know, electric cars have been around for a while, but just recently have they really been, what I would say, very usable. So today, GM's electric cars can drive 500 kilometers uh, on a single range. So that's, you know, from where I grew up in Windsor, all the way past Toronto. So that's really, really cool. They're also a lot faster and quieter, so they're very fun to drive. Um, and they're also a lot stronger. So we now have trucks uh, and really heavy duty cars that can be made out of um, electric vehicles. Um, so that's kind of really cool. And then the really exciting things in here in Canada, what we're doing, so this came uh, plan that I talked about earlier, they we're changing them ho the whole factory up. So they're gonna be Canada's first factory to be converted from a gas power kind of factory into one that will produce electric vehicles. And then they're gonna start making electric powered vans um, for transportation. So think of all of these things um, that we buy online and how they get delivered. So these delivery vans are gonna be made in Kami 
will help get these things to your home from the warehouse or the store in a carbon neutral way and release no emissions. So that's kind of really exciting to see uh, how we're trying to take what we're doing, but impact other businesses and other things that you don't always think about when you think about driving. Um, and, you know, and we're also doing other really neat things in terms of not just cars, but in planes and trains and even boats now. So really trying to set that foundation and help every way we can to help everyone lower their carbon emissions. Um, and I can help with all of that, and which is really exciting. I love working with so many different people, different companies, and try to see what are they doing in the world of sustainability? How can I make it bigger and better? And how can I help other companies be more sustainable as well? You know, you mentioned how um, electric cars have been around for a while, but it's mm -hmm. now you, like, I noticed my neighbors have bought electric cars. They are becoming nice, yeah. a lot more common. And you go to the grocery store and there's all these stations to charge your car yeah. while you're getting your groceries. So it's definitely a lot more accessible, right, to, to, to everyone. Ahmed, any kind of experiments uh, you can recommend kids do at home? Yeah, so I think to kind of link the impact of global warming into uh, our world, so when, you know, they mentioned when that carbon gets trapped uh, near the earth, uh, it warms up the water. And when water gets heated up a little bit, it expands so the carbon molecules just go a little bit further apart from one another. So one way to see this at home is take a glass of water and then put a couple of ice cubes in it and then fill it just to the rim with water and then leave it. And as the ice cube melts, you'll see that the water is going to overflow uh, from the sides of the cup. So that's kind of water taking up more space and more volume. So now think of that, but to the ocean, where you've got billions of trillions of liters of water, and just a tiny little bit more can make a huge impact on a lot more water. And that's what causes a lot of the floods and the storms that we see. Um, I think if you want to see, you know, and do more experiments, I'll do a little plug for, you know, the GM electrifying engineering um, YouTube videos. So a lot of really fun little experiments and you know things that you can do that don't need a lot of material that you don't find at home. And you can build little tiny electric cars and motors and just learn about things. And you know, I think one of them, you can get to build your own little mini car and, and drive it around. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Excellent. I love, I love experiments in home, encouraging kids to just find things uh, just lying around the house and doing some science. And do something fun with it. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, I mean, what would you say is the best part of your job? What gets you excited when you go to work? Ooh, um, I would say working at GM Canada, um, it's really a place where like I can be myself. So yes, I love the projects. I love the people I work with, they're phenomenal. But, you know, being able to bring my whole self to work, um, you know, I really feel valued for my thoughts and who I am and what makes me unique. And I really appreciate that. There's no nine to five Ahmed and like a post to work Ahmed. It's just, just me. Um, and I love that. I love that I'm, you know, encouraged to use my creativity and uniqueness and my job. Um, there's, you know, that focus on work-life balance and that makes my life a lot more enjoyable and to bring that authentic, authentic self into work. Um, you know, someone, I, I'm someone who really values that trust and that respect um, for everyone and the environment. And to feel that being echoed at work and with my colleagues and my bosses, it's very like empowering. And I mm -hmm. feel like I belong. Right. Um, you know, I, I think I bring a little bit of a sparkle into work because of that. And I think I'm a little bit biased, but I think GM benefits from that. Of course, um, I'm by sure. just me being me. And yeah, so I really, I really do love that part. Oh, that's great. That's a great answer. Actually, like that could be anybody could say that your thoughts being valued and, and being heard are just so important everywhere in school and work and um, mm, everyday every, life. Yeah. That's for sure. Right. Um, you know, and you also touched upon uh, your creativity. I find, um, you know, engineering, of course, there's that math and science aspect, but it's such a great mm -hmm. career if you're also creative. Right. It does combine um, all those elements together. If a kid is watching this and says, yes, mm -hmm. I want to go into engineering. I always want to give them ideas of what they can do now in order to get them on that path in the future. So I see the first thing is like, is a don't do, don't be intimidated by science and math. I know it can seem very daunting. I know I, as a kid, yes, I was very curious, but I wasn't very book smart. I didn't do that great in school, to be honest. Um, and I did str struggle a lot with science, especially physics. Um, but I think if you're patient and you take it one piece at a time, 
And then you ask a lot of questions and get help and resources, you will get it. So I think focus on that, um, but also learn outside of school and classes. I think, again, ask questions and, you know, wonder about things and look into it. You know, Google things. I still Google things all the time, even if I'm working outside of work. I mean, come like, oh, I wonder how that happens. And, you know, you can find it out now with the Internet. Right. Um, I'm also very old school. Like I said, I thought my librarian was the coolest person ever. I still do think that I love the library. I love a good old book. Yep. Um, so, you know, go to the library or research things online. Um, but then also be one thing I also always tell engineers or if you want to be an engineer is be well rounded. So what that means is don't just be really good at one thing, but learn about a lot about different things and different people. And when one way to do that is going to be outside of your class. So volunteer and get involved in your community. I think you will learn so much. You'll get to meet very interesting people and it'll just be fun. Um, right. So like, it's great on all fronts. Yeah. Um, and that could really help you, A, um, learn about what's happening and then you can see, oh, I like this. I don't like that. So it'll help you shape what you want to do or what part of science and math and engineering you'd want to do. Um, and then just kind of go from there step by step. Right. That's great advice. And, you know, you're not the first guest I've had to say Good. you don't have to be an A-plus student. Um, you do, yes. <laughs> yeah. Right? A, no, a lot yeah. of it is just learning how to learn and loving learning, asking questions and figuring out how to find the answers is really more important. Just That's 100% true. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I said it at the outset and I'll say it again. Mm -hmm. You are the recipient of the Clean 50 Emerging Leader Award. So congratulations. I think that's amazing. Thank you. Um, Thank tell you. everybody what those awards are all about. Uh, yeah, so the, the Clean 50 Emerging Leader Award, they're for young adults in Canada working in this area of sustainability. Uh, and they're seen as kind of like thought leaders and have a big impact. Um, I think it's, it's truly an honor. It's like very humbling. I highly encourage people to look them up. And to see all the other amazing winners, I am just shook by like all the great work they have done. And that's what I really liked actually about being part of this group is just learning from them. Um, and again, asking questions and then seeing, oh, you know, maybe you can help me with this. I can help you with that. And it has fostered like a lot of collaboration, which is really cool. Um, and it doesn't end there with you. There is uh, honestly so much to touch upon, Ahmed. I don't know how you put it all in, but you're also the founding member of the Gender Identity Advisory Board at GM mm -hmm. Canada. So I'm going to ask you the million dollar question. How do we promote diversity and inclusivity in the workforce? Sure. So to answer your first question, um, you know, I think it's how do you have that diverse and inclusive workforce? I think you have to just promote a working environment and a culture that everyone is allowed to flourish and everyone is empowered and feels, like I said earlier, welcomed and can do their best. I think as humans, we all have great ideas, but then if you don't feel welcome and no one is asking you for those ideas, you're not gonna share them. And you won't really get to shine and contribute your best. And if you're a company and your employees aren't contributing and doing their best, then you're not gonna do so well, right? right. Um, so you know, we need to kind of have this environment where everyone can come in, feel really, you know, not challenged to be who they are um and you know it's a lot of things that we take for granted so you know maybe it's putting your pronouns in your uh, email or asking someone how they like to be referred to as or how do they pronounce their name um you know if you're on a big team and you're playing an event ask people hey would you want to do this and see how well you know how much they like it right. if you're a manager think about oh who am I always giving the big projects to? Who am I always sending to conferences and why? Um, and I think that really lets you build a more cohesive um, working environment. Um, you know, other things that we can do in our day-to-day, -day, honestly, it's small things. It's, you know, make, not making jokes at someone else's expense, not laughing when someone says something rude that's supposed to be funny and just saying, like, hey, that's not funny. Right. Um, you know, create activities that everyone wants to do um, I think is really going to help everyone out. Um, but yeah, and I think to answer your second question, so about this innovation piece, I do okay. strongly believe a, a diverse and cohesive workforce drives innovation. Um, Deloitte, a consulting company, just did some research last year, the year before, and they said a diverse workforce um, within a company could mean 200% uh, better finances. So boom, there you go. There's a fun there financial go. money link right there. <laughs> But, you know, I think mean, you take a step back. Yes, I, I think there's lots of research and it's obvious that there is a link 
to business benefits and inclusivity. But I think, again, take a step back and you think about it. It's just really about being a decent human being. It's mm -hmm. about thinking about other people, you know, what challenges some of us face, um, thinking how can we all succeed? And then like, when you think about that and you try to solve it, then everyone does better, including yourself. So it's really kind of a all win solution. Right, right. And it starts yeah. young, right? All these things that you said, we can start at home and in the right. classroom yeah. and at work. That's great. Yep. Um, um, <laughs> you've also said that in your current role, you need to be curious and comfortable <laughs> being uncomfortable. What do you mean by that? Uh, I think it's just me. I do love saying that. That's <laughs> so a yeah. great quote. Um, but I think you just have to push yourself um, a little bit outside of your comfort level. Like I said before, I was a very curious kid, but I just like really kept on myself and it wasn't until I pushed myself out a little bit, you know, from my personal experience, volunteering with Engineers Without Borders really opened up my eye to things I wasn't day to day exposed to. So just trying new things and trying new things that you don't think you're going to be good at uh, is really the one way for us to learn and grow. I think if you do the same thing over and over, you won't really change. And I think now more than ever, we need change, um, change for the better. So, you know, ask questions, learn, um, go out and see. And I think I said it before, but when you ask questions, it doesn't have to be a question that someone knows the answer to. You can ask questions to a group, even if no one knows the answer to it, but then together think about, oh, well, what is that answer? And like go outside of your area of expertise or what you like to do uh, and try to find out that answer. I think, you know, we can do a lot of great things, a lot more exciting, cool things when we do it together. Um, right. way more than what any one of us can do alone. So yeah, yeah. that's kind yeah. of what I usually mean by it. Yeah, um, it is a little bit scary to do something outside of your comfort zone, but um, <laughs> it feels really good when you accomplish that though, right? Yeah, yeah, amazing, yeah. Yeah, so I'm guessing, Ahmed, that you love cars. It's just a guess. Um, <laughs> I want you to describe your ideal road trip to me. Where are you going? Uh, what What are you driving? What are you listening to? Is it Tim Hortons? Sure. What, what's a road trip for you? So actually funny enough, I, I do love road trips, so we'll get to that in a minute, but cars, funny enough, I actually was not into cars. I barely knew the difference between a motor and an engine. <laughs> don't tell my boss. Uh, yeah, don't tell my manager until I started working at GM. Um, but I think that made me better, because again, going back to pushing myself out of my comfort zone and then pushing my coworkers, having them right. explain things to me and like really question things and not take, well, this is how we have to do something, because I'm like, I don't know how we did it. Um, but yeah, back to your question about road trips. I do love road trips. Um, and I've got one coming up next week. I'll be off to Mexico and then into Central America. Oh, lovely. Uh, so I'm very excited for that. Um, but I would say my all-time favorite road trip was just a few last summer. I was going to say a few months, but it's been a while now. But yeah, last summer, we went up to Northern Ontario and I did the whole coast, uh, the Canadian side of Lake Superior. And it was just so beautiful surreal and so close to home and you know an area i've never been to so um i also yes you're right there's always a playlist going i think my friends know i always have a playlist for every occasion i'm working on the playlist for this road trip um a lot of sing-alongs it's going to be a lot of like classics britney spears lady gaga will have i am also a huge fan of motown Oh. Um, so some Aretha Franklin, Tina Turner, it's a little bit old, I don't know how, <laughs> if the kids are listening, um, way back from the 80s, but yeah, a lot of very fun music. You know, it's true though, during the pandemic, a lot of people did a lot more local yeah. trips, and you've discovered a part of our Ontario that you might not have gone on. I would, that's yeah. what I was saying, I, don't, I can't believe it took a whole pandemic for me to explore somewhere not too far, <laughs> and it's beautiful. And what are you drinking? Are you Tim Hortons or Starbucks? Where do you stop with your Ooh. car? So on a road trip, definitely coffee. Um, I would say I'd like to stop by like a little shop that I wouldn't be able to find here in Toronto. Um, something a bit different. Um, and then I would also say French fries. Um, I think I love to see how different places do their own take on fries. And I mean, who doesn't love French fries? So yeah. Yeah, who doesn't, right? Like, <laughs> who doesn't love fries? What's a perfect Sunday afternoon, Ahmed? Uh, I would say definitely a good brunch, start of the day, uh, hopefully it's nice weather, I'll take my dog Denali, she's right here sleeping, uh, for a nice stroll, uh, farmer's market, pick up some produce, and then usually kind of like a big family style dinner with my friends in the kitchen, we're all cooking, laughing, being loud, um, but yeah. Sounds perfect. 
And uh, my dog's sleeping beside me too. And I'm so grateful oh, no. that they stayed quiet for the entire interview. Same, yeah, like that. Same you. That's great. Ahmed, thanks so much for joining us. This has been so inspiring. You have so many great messages for kids that are listening. And I, I really love the theme of sustainability and being curious and asking questions. That's the way to do it, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.